Um, so, great to be joined by Bank of England Chief Economist Andy Halliday. Um, you have, actually throughout the crisis, been relatively optimistic about the bounce back as and when it comes. What's your current feeling about how strong the recovery will be? Much the same, Robert, actually. Nice to be here. So, the, I mean, the reason for that was really, you know, the cause of the initial fall mm. was those restrictions, the lockdown restrictions. That's why it was atypically sharp, the slowdown. Mm. Therefore, as those restrictions are removed, as we hope they are during the course of the first half of this year, mm. you expect an atypically sharp bounce back. Mm. And that's why, you know, my sense was, when it comes, mm. it will come fast and it will be large. And first is fastest recovery, you know, for a century. Yeah, as it was the sharpest recession to begin with. Um, so what are the risks? Well, there's the obvious risks, risks around the virus and the vaccination uh, programme. Truth be told, we don't know, you know, really how people respond as they emerge. Mm. Will there be ongoing caution, ongoing unwillingness to go out or to spend? We don't know for sure. That's certainly one risk. My sense would be, though, chatting to people, they are desperate to get their lives back, desperate to get out spending and socialising and working. And if that happens, and if some of those savings that Lucia just mentioned do get spent, even a small amount of them, mm. we're talking about a pretty rip-roaring recovery. And, and um, we're all connected across the world. Um, it is striking that the recovery in the EU... Uh, well, it hasn't really materialised. Many people think it'll be delayed because they haven't got the vaccines rolled out. It would sort of be rational, uh, if we want faster recovery, for the UK to help them a bit with their vaccine programme because that would help us with our economic recovery, wouldn't it? I think at some stage that the logic of that must be right. You know, vaccines are generally global public good. For the UK to grow consistently, we want the world to be growing mm. as well. So, yeah, I think uh, as and when the time comes, absolutely, mm. this is a, a problem that's better shared because uh, it's a collective problem. Now, um, you, the Bank of England, did some important work on all those ex excess savings that were built up. We've just been talking about them. One of the hopes for recovery is that some of those savings get spent uh, and, and demand in the economy increases. But the other thing that you're acutely aware of is those savings tend to be with richer people. If you look at the poorest quarter of this country, they actually got into debt more, they are poorer uh, than when the crisis started. Do you have any reason to believe that these really serious inequalities are going to do anything but get worse? Well, there's no question that um, this hasn't been an equal opportunity crisis in any way, shape or form. It's at hardest uh, the youngest, the poorest, the least skilled uh, women and ethnic minorities. You're right, there's a big pool of savings out there, in aggregate. Mm. We're talking probably, Robert, £150 billion mm. in households, mostly held among those higher-income households. And that's why it's really important that money is spent. Mm. Because if it's spent in restaurants, in pubs, in cinemas, at football stadia, that will generate the demand and the jobs mm. that will aid the recovery. Those either made unemployed... Mm all those currently furloughed, will find a way back into work if those savings are spent. But what do we do about that inequality problem, though? Well, that's a problem we'll absolutely need to look at again as we emerge from this crisis. First and foremost, it's about job creation. That's the biggest single source of a compression of that distribution of yeah. incomes. Thereafter, the agenda is about what's called the supply side of the economy. It's about education, it's about skills, mm. it's about investment. Mm. So short term, it's about that big boost to demand mm. to get those jobs back. Mm. Longer term, it's about skills, education, infrastructure and investment. We need both ingredients, demand and supply, to close those inequality gaps. Andy, I've got tons more I want to talk to you about. So plenty more with Andy Haldane after the break. Also lots more with Yvette and Amber and the brilliant Harry Potter actor, uh, Jason Isaacs. And we'll be talking about asylum with him because he represents the British Red Cross. See you in a minute.
Welcome back. Tom, still to discuss with the Bank of England's Andy Haldane. First, Anushka. Thank you, Robert. Now, we know that life has changed a lot this year, but will some of the changes stay in place when we head back to that dream normality or will it be a new normal? I want to show you some interesting polling that basically ask people, compared to the year before the pandemic, do you think you will do more or same, or same or less of things after it? So here's a few examples. So pink are people saying less, yellow, more. Walking, one, four out of ten say that they would do more of that. Lots of people say they will talk to their family more. Lots of people say that they will shop more locally. 8% think that they're going to be going to the pub much more, although I have to say a similar number say they're going to the pub much less. So that lot have obviously enjoyed staying at home. Let me show you a few more. Lots of people think that they might do more video calls, although a good number also totally fed up, from the, fed up of them. And then what about working from home? Here we go. 17% are hoping that they will work from home a little more often. And that therefore chimes with the 17% who think that they will be commuting less. Robert. That's Anushka. And it was actually about changes to the way we work, changing the economy I wanted to sort of pick up on, really. I was very struck that McKinsey, uh, I think they came up with a statistic that we could, as an economy, sort of work about a third of our hours from home and the, the, the wealth we produce, our productivity, would not fall. Uh, lots of businesses say they are going to encourage their people to work from home. Do you think mm. this is a permanent change? I do, I do. And in some ways, I mean, the crazy thing was the equilibrium we're locked in before. You know, so many of us spent too many of our working hours doing, you know, the least productive, least well-paid um, form of work ever invented, namely commuting. So cutting that out of the equation, I think, is a big boon, potentially, not just for productivity, but for our general well-being. And, so, I mean, just to be clear, if that then leads to quite a lot of property becoming redundant, office space, that kind of thing... Mm -hmm. uh, certain, you know, shops in parts of the world where, you know, there won't be the same density of workers. Is that something we should worry about? Well, it depends what happens next. If what happens next is that commercial property, those offices, mm. those shops, converted to flats and houses, that helps solve another problem, our residential housing uh, problem. If activity uh, and spending is happening locally mm. rather than city centres, that helps the cause of levelling up. So there really are opportunities in this if we are crafty about this new social contract between workers and employers. And so what you're saying is the government has to be a bit activist, shouldn't just be sort of fatalist. If, if we're seeing central London, for example, changing because there are offices empty, they've got to help speed the conversion. To a degree, that's true. For example. And that, this isn't a case mm. of, you know, hollowing out of cities. That won't happen. No. London and the other big cities will still have this magnetic, magnetic attraction mm. for people, for commerce, for finance, for skills. Mm. But could this be the thing that slows down and evens out activity mm. and jobs and spending? Mm. Yes, it could. OK, that's interesting. Now, a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about. Um, one was I was quite struck by the Prime Minister saying that the reason we'd had this great vaccine success was because of greed. Uh, he basically seemed to be saying unfettered capitalism. Now, you chair something called the Industrial Strategy Council. They put out a paper today saying the reason uh, we were so brilliant at producing this vaccine is because there was an amazing partnership between private sector, public sector, voluntary sector. Greed didn't play a role at all. Yeah, I mean, the vaccine success story wasn't about the C word that's capitalism. Mm. It was about the three C words that were coordination, cooperation and co-creation. Yeah. In this case, co-creation between science, universities, private companies, the NHS and volunteers. And what kind of lessons does that have for how we are going to become a more prosperous place? Well, you go back to those, those key points, those foundations from before, education, skills, investment, infrastructure, innovation. You look internationally, you know, the, the secret source of each and every one of those is that buddying up, is that partnership between public and private and voluntary sectors. That is the lesson if we are to build back better, I think. And then, finally, um, you may or may not have seen uh, that uh, David Cameron has been reported as going to the Bank of England and asking for emergency help for this struggling, now deeply struggling business, Greensill. Was it inappropriate of David Cameron to ask the Bank of England for help? Not to ask. Um, that help was not offered. We had very clear criteria 
about accessing, in this case, one of our financing facilities, and the firm in, in question, Greensill, did not meet the criteria and therefore wasn't granted access. So asking is fine, and the purpose of clear criteria is it gives you the means of saying no, and we did. Andy, lovely to see you. And you as well, Robert. Come back soon, we hope.